Okay, finally, the Broads have some good news for us. Taylor Swift is apparently launching her tour, and there's a huge controversy over not being going to Cleveland, which probably works out for Bree, who lives closer to Pittsburgh at this point than Cleveland. But uh, no, I oh, I guess the Browns did win a big game, and the NFL trade deadline came and went. So I guess that's more important. But nevertheless, I, I know certain people who have been on this podcast are probably quietly more excited about the other thing, at least for uh, when when it comes through. But the Browns win. They beat the Bengals. They didn't just beat the Bengals. They beat the shit out of the Bengals in a game that it's sort of one of these games where like you look, you go in and you're like, eh, I don't know, man. We're 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 down David Njoku. We're down Denzel Ward. We're down JOK. We're down Wyatt Teller. I could see where this goes really badly. And on the other hand, you're like, well, they don't have Jamar Chase. And for whatever reason, the Browns just seem to have the Bengals number, which Joe Burrow said as much after the game. And lo and behold, the Browns get out to a 25 to zero lead in a game that was bizarre but nevertheless uh 32 13 victory all of a sudden after a four game losing streak they're three and five and everybody wants to talk about the postseason again how where are we at Bree? <laughs> okay so a couple of things i have to touch on the taylor swift news because i myself am also a swifty i know abby who filled in for me on the show last week also is and she released this amazing article about how taylor swift subconsciously her entire album was based on the cleveland browns and I thought that was amazing. And then I messaged Abby yesterday and was like, Abby, I have to like draft off of this because I actually think there are specific lyrics that pertain to being a Browns fan. So when I have a moment over the weekend, perhaps I am going to release a lyric from every single Taylor Swift song on her new album and how it pertains and relates to being a Cleveland Browns fan. So if you are a Swifty Browns fan, look forward to that. I'll go on top of Abby's tweet and then also yes the concert dates were announced cleveland was not one of them but i did enter the pre-sale draft for <laughs> tickets to buy tickets that's how you have to do things these days but you're not even guaranteed tickets but you have to enter this i don't know this space on the internet to be able to have the opportunity to even buy a ticket that you may not get crazy world we live in but very excited about that also this is coming off of a wonderful wonderful victory uh, so this Tuesday slash Monday, actually coming off of Halloween and my little guy's seventh birthday birthday, I've had a great Monday, Tuesday, my expectations for this game were so low that they were almost high. Like I, I was talking myself into over the weekend, how big of a letdown this game was going to be, because I felt like we were so jaded, not only from how this season has played out, but from last year's Halloween game. <laughs> if you recall how bad that was on, on a Sunday that I was like, my expectations have dropped so low for this team. I don't know who they are that I expected them to come out and like, just completely surprise and delight us. And that's exactly what happened. Now I will say it didn't quite feel that way until we went into the second half. Like the first half was weird because it felt like we were dominating without actually dominating on the scoreboard. If that makes sense. The first quarter was interesting. Um, <laughs> I, other than other than the New England Patriots game, I've genuinely enjoyed most of the games I've watched. You know, it you don't want to see the team. Yes, lose, the outcomes but, have not been great, but they're but they're, they're like fun to watch. There's always stuff where you can go, all right. You know, the defense was really yes. bad this week, or you know, the special teams continue to be a nightmare. But look at this offense. Look at Amari Cooper. Look at Donovan Peoples Jones. Oh, look Amari. at David Njoku. All these things you're sitting there going, it's not where we want to be, but like this is at least fun. And the first quarter watching the game and ex- like being online, like attached to social media, it was like a miserable experience. One play into the game, the Browns get called <laughs> for an admittedly stupid penalty for 12 yes. men on the field that was en- ended up being declined. And we're already off into firing Joe Woods. <laughs> By the everyone. end of that quarter, we were firing, you know, and these aren't just like, Fan, these aren't just angry fans. These are like media people. Some of these are media people who are like, fire Joe Woods, fire uh, Mike Prefer, and cut Cade York. That was in the course of a quarter in a game. Oh, yeah. the Browns were not losing. Like they were, and the defense played really well and all this. And, you know, it's just like, there is such a level of apprehension and anger. And I get it on some level, but it's like, oh my God, like 
it was as if the Browns were down 30 and it was a tie football game. And again, and, and this all happened in a game the Browns would ultimately dominate. Like it's yeah, I mean, challenging. We are such prisoner of the moment fans. And especially because we are obviously coming off of like some really, really bad losses and or like very surprising losses that yes, it's like every bad thing that the Browns do or every mistake that they make is just overanalyzed or magnified. And it's just like this instant reaction of like, okay, this is like the last time. Like, I can't believe we're still putting up with this type of thing. The only time that I got frustrated in the first quarter, and I believe this was, this happened in the first quarter. My memory is not great, Pete, but when it, it it felt like the defense was actually outside of the 12 men on the field situation, they were off to like a pretty decent start, mm -hmm. but then we get into like, you know, it's third and long and we give up, you know, like a 18 to 25 yard play. Like to me, like that's more frustrating than some of the other things that we've witnessed, but then they got a turnover, like right after that happened. So I was like, here I am like sitting here being mad about it. And then the next play, Miles Garrett tips the ball and the Browns get an interception. And I felt like that point I was like, okay, like this is a great momentum changer. Miles Garrett was playing out of his mind. AJ Green stepped up in a really big way. And, and then that kind of continued. I mean, it all kind of came back when, Cade York missed the field goal where it felt like, oh no, like this, it's going to be a game that goes like this for us, right? We're like, everything's doom and gloom again because we can't just catch a break. But then the Bengals kept misfiring or like mm -hmm. things were not lining up for them either. And then we finally, finally scored a touchdown. And that's when I was like, okay, we, we look more comfortable. We'd started opening up the pass game. Like I was seeing people complaining about the banana play. Like I know Amari Cooper screwed up. <laughs> like that was not good. I mean, Michael Woods was open, like in yes. all fairness, yes, he like was. He was wide open. ass open. Like I get it. I get that people get mad because the play didn't execute, but had that play executed, people would have been like, Kevin Stefanski's a genius. So it, it truly like just, it matters if something ends up working out or not. Hindsight's 2020, right? Like hindsight is 2020. But I, like people I, I saw were like calling for like, we need to run the ball where we, we were not running the ball. Nick Chubb's sitting out on the series. And I was sitting there thinking like, we have to establish a pass game. They, they are not respecting our offense when it comes to Jacoby Brissett throwing the ball. Like he, we need to execute some throws and, and then like the run game is going to open up. So that finally started clicking. And then the run game, Nick Chubb, like he was more effective. People are just, our fan base is just so close-minded and so just in the moment reactionary that they can't, they can't see the bigger picture at play. Yeah, like I said, I you and I both understand the frustration. It just happens to make itself, you know, happen in in less than ideal situations where it just becomes absurdly impatient to yes. a point they're like, you let them do it. Yeah, the first drive of the Bengals, I I was thinking, okay, you know, they started moving, they they were on their yeah. opening yep. script note, and I was thinking, okay, the Browns will do what they always do, which is allow a team to go right down the field and then somehow force them into a field goal. Yes, it exactly. It seems to be the opening. It just seems to be the script. It's great that they don't allow the touchdown, but you don't want to give out the field goal. And then they make they make the play uh, with Miles Garrett and AJ Green. What I liked about what I saw on the defense, even on that first drive, is guys were flying around. Yes, um, consistently, like they were confident. They were playing fast. They weren't getting frustrated. They weren't pointing fingers. They were just playing and getting after it in a way that like it looked like it carried over from the previous week and that's ultimately what happened and like that's the stuff you know when when we saw the the fallout from the Patriots game and John Johnson says all the stuff he says and he's not the messenger anyone wants to hear it from but he was right and it forced them to sort of deal with it and it seems like that has worked I hate that it had to come to this for the second year in a row but it seems to have worked the Browns were way more prepared for the Ravens game on defense and the yes. play was significantly better. They played a whole lot faster, more confident. The tackling was better and they were executing. And then the same thing happened in this game. They, you know, they were doing a lot of things that made sense relative to what the Bengals like to do and what Joe Burrow likes to do. And they just played fast and they didn't. It was sort of like re reminded me of Baker Mayfield's rookie year 
um, in the sense that the Browns had a really bad defense that year. But yes. like when the Browns had a setback that year, you're already like, okay, yeah, they're going to go back and get it because that was like the vibe that year had where it was like, whatever, they make a mistake, they'll come back and get it. It could have been whatever. There was always this feeling of no problem. They're going to come back and get points. I feel like the defense sort of had that a little bit of that mentality of so what they got a first down, we're going to come back and and make the next play. And even on one of those, you know, third downs where they converted, it was like, it, you know, after the AJ green pick, they came back and it was like uh, Higgins intercepted a pass that would look like it was going to AJ green. It was like, yeah, it's a good play by the Bengals, but it's a good play by the Bengals. It wasn't a bad play by the Browns. They had two defenders there. The Bengals yeah. just happened to make the play, which is fine. So I was like, pretty happy with that. And then it just started like gaining momentum. And then it went from, you could make, make the case that was a lucky stop with the interception, but then it went from there to, no, they're just not going to let them move the ball. They're going to create negative plays. They're going to make Joe, uh, Joe Burrow's night uh, nightmarish. And it just, they got more and more confident, even with all the injuries they had, you saw guys like obviously miles Garrett played incredibly well, but you saw guys like step up. Sione Taki Taki is a guy yeah. who's played Sam linebacker, but with all the injuries they had, he played more. He offers some size that helps against the run game. The Bengals didn't even try, which was weird, but he <laughs> played well, just flying around and making tackles. AJ Green makes a key play. Isaiah Thomas is a rookie, gets out there and, and gets a big sack and makes a couple of plays. Like you saw guys stepping up and this is sort of what the Browns were last year, especially at corner when AJ green would have to play or some of these other guys, uh, MJ Stewart, when he was with the team, which was a guy who suddenly stepped up and played really well in the second half of the year, you're like starting to see some of those things, which like, it was fun to watch them play like that. Obviously you want the Browns to have the ball and score points and it took them a while to get there. But if the defense can play like that and continue and they can build some momentum, then all of a sudden you look at this and you go, the Browns offense is eventually going to find a way to score, which is literally what happened in this game. They, were clunky and awkward for, you know, a good quarter, quarter and a half. They finally get the touchdown and then they make that really smooth transition. This is where the Browns used to be really good. When the Browns went to the playoffs in 2020, getting a stop, uh, forcing a a field goal attempt that, that the Bengals would miss, getting the ball 40 seconds on your own 37 yard line, getting to their 37 yard line, getting a field goal, then Coming a 50 yard, 55 yeah. yard field goal, which big kick for, for, for Cade York, who people wanted to cut moments earlier. Uh, that was a, that was a big time kick in a game with some bizarre weather as, as the Bengals kicker sort of made it clear that that was what was going on. They get the ball to start the third quarter and they drive right down the field and score. Like they get that 10 points. Yeah. The momentum. Yeah. And all of a sudden it's, it's like, You've, then the game was totally in control. And that's something that the Browns used to be really good at in 2020 and has sort of lost that. And now they're reclaiming that a little bit. Now that's like the stuff that goes from, you can be an average football team, but when you get those little details, right, you're going to put yourself in position to win. And it put the Bengals in a spot where they were suddenly way behind, uh, you know, you couldn't rule them out at that point because they are explosive enough. They can score a lot of points, but in that moment, 18 to zero, you felt like the Browns were in control in a way that they hadn't been in sort of previous games. You know, obviously the Jets and the, and the Panthers games had the the issues at the end, but it was it still had a different feel to it in this game. Yeah, they also got the two point conversion, which I felt like was when that happened, I was like, OK, feels like feels like those two points while being like very small in the grand scheme of things meant a whole lot. I don't know. Maybe that's stupid, but it, it no, just, it's it, it, look, <laughs> listen, like we, we've talked about this. Obviously you weren't on this uh, on the pod last week, but uh, you and I sort of talked about the third and two play the previous week where, you know, people are going, Oh, you got to run the ball. But like, your players love when you're aggressive like that. They want yes. to go yeah. for it. They want to go and score points. They want to like be put in situations where they can win the game themselves or fourth down and being aggressive. Like players feed off that two point conversion in that situation. The Bengals had a penalty. It gave them a shorter field. It you know it gave them more reason to do it. But they went for it and like 
that was an energizing move. Like, yeah, to, it usually doesn't work out for the team. But, well, I, like, but yeah, but I mean, even when they don't get it, like you, you listen to post game press conferences and like you, you hear them ask players and like, no, we want to go for it. We, we love that they have the confidence in us and we've got to go make those plays. So you miss a few fine, but if, if, if that becomes the, the, the norm, if that becomes the understanding, it doesn't feel as pressured. It just becomes, this is what, just what we do. It becomes easier. You gain more confidence. You get more comfortable in that situation. It doesn't feel like you're worrying about breaking something like dropping a plate or whatever at, in these situations. So like when Deshaun Watson comes back, personally, I think they should go for two, like constantly, just because they're going to be that dynamic offensively. But even with Brissett, he's a freaking Jeep. Let him do it. Like yeah. and he he's yeah. able to do those things. So I love that. And I, and I was really, you know, it was interesting to watch that the Browns went, were down multiple tight ends and just said, screw it. We're going to put eight linemen on the field right. and mm-hmm. go for it. And they go with the, the creative direct snap to, to Nick Chubb, which yep. is great. Um, and allowed him to, you know, just go and score. I thought it was interesting in this game. Even though, you know, and we'll talk about Kareem Hunt and his status a little bit later, but down near the goal line, the Browns multiple times said, no, we're going with Nick Chubb. Yeah. Yep. And he capitalized. Like, I thought maybe that was a little bit of, hey, we've got to sort of practice this in case Kareem Hunt's not here. But it was nice that they succeeded in those moments. And yeah, get going up eight nothing. It's, you know, that extra little bit of deflating momentum for the Bengals, getting the field goal, coming back and getting that touchdown. Like, it felt like they were really moving well. And you mentioned, you know, people wanting to run the ball. Like, I don't get it. I had like somebody arguing with me. The Browns scored because they scored the touchdown because they went to Nick Chubb as if I'm against running the ball. I'm not, but the Browns were averaging like over 10 yards per pass. Like, yes. Yeah. That's pretty good. You want to keep rolling with that. And and that's what ultimately happened is on that drive where, where they scored the touchdown they go deep to uh they go deep to Amari Cooper on that deep cross. The next play, they have to back out a little bit. It opens up a running lane for Nick Chubb. They did this multiple times over the course of the game where they would find somebody down the field because the Bengals were so, so committed up front to try to contain Nick Chubb that it allowed uh Jacoby Brissett to just sort of pick apart the defense uh and find open receivers. And fortunately, despite the fact they didn't have Najoku. Omari Cooper and Donovan Peoples-Jones were really good in this game, and it helped that the Bengals came in without Eli Apple and then proceeded to have all of their corners get injured, which sucks. But, you know, they made the most of the opportunity, which is which is what you want. And I think I I like averaged it out. I think it was like over 12 yards per per target between those two guys for the game. Like if that's what you're getting, don't tell me about running the ball. Yeah, you want balance and everything, but like. There were multiple situations where Chubb is just running into a wall. And yes. yes, they sort of figured it out. But it's not, you don't run for the sake of running. You run for the sake of, you have the ability to, to make the offense work. You're running to set up the pass. You're passing to set up the run. And ultimately, like Kevin Stefanski's whole philosophy is, is making it passes look like runs and runs look like passes. All of this is to get the defense on their heels. And I give credit to the Bengals defensively. Only from the standpoint in previous matchups, the Browns would just cause them to misalign with all the ways they move linemen around, some of the shifts. The Bengals did a far, far better job in terms of alignment and assignment, but the Browns were just better. And that's a credit to what they were doing. But I thought, you know, the Bengals did far better in that as opposed to like last year in Cincinnati where the Browns just ran roughshod over them because they were constantly out of alignment. Yeah. And I want to touch on a couple of things because we obviously, have a number on the Bengals, uh, specifically Joe Burrow. And he hasn't, he hasn't beaten the Browns. Um, but, and a lot of people are like quite puzzled or perplexed by that because the Bengals were a top rated offense and defense coming into this game. And I don't think it, it, it was a fluke, right? It wasn't just like a small sample size. Like this has been a pretty consistent thing for them after they got over kind of those first, the first couple of games But I do think when you look at this team, the Browns have the advantage in terms of like mismatches. So we were dominating on both sides of the line to me, um, which like we just controlled like Joe Burrow had zero time. He looked extremely uncomfortable. Miles Garrett just like ate up 
any matchup that he was faced with the balance of the defense. And we were pretty thin too on defense. Um, in totality, obviously linebacker was a position, but then even from like a quarter cornerback room, you know, it, it was, it was a different mix with Denzel Ward being out. And they were saying that greedy was sick, like throughout the entire week, Thank like not fish. feeling, <laughs> yeah, no, not feeling a hundred percent. You had um, the change of JJ three being the green dot, right. From a safety mm-hmm. standpoint. Um, so, so this defense was actually constructed in a way of being different in terms of player personnel, who the, who the um, green dot was. And it was nice to see not only like all of them kind of step up to play, but miles Garrett, the superstar, like really shine in, in this specific game. We just looked like we, we were the better, the better team overall. And then like on the flip side, our offensive line was obviously, I mean, our offensive line is always really good, but like when you look at them, like against Cincinnati's, like Cincinnati's team, like really Jacoby was pretty comfortable the entire night. Um, And then I would say like, it's not like our wide receivers are spectacular. Amari Cooper is a hundred percent. Donovan Peoples Jones, like is really, has been really good. Mm -hmm. Jacoby Brissett obviously had a really great game yesterday, but he's been, sometimes turns into a pumpkin. It's like when the clock hits two, two minutes left in the game, that's when he turns into a pumpkin. Um, And we've talked about that, but he overall played a really good game. So I I guess when you think of it, think of like the team in terms of like the matchups, like, yeah, like the Browns just seem to really be a better team than the Bengals. When you look at it in terms of an overall, like the the, the Bengals just, they're not a good match for the Browns. And I think, when, when you look at how Andrew Berry has constructed this team, the Browns defense specifically does match up pretty well when you look at the AFC North, right? Like even mm-hmm. against the Ravens two weeks ago or whenever that was a week ago, you know, we were in that game. We had a chance to win that game. And I, and I would say like we were built to hang with the Ravens, to hang with this Bengals team and this Bengals offense and this powerful you know, tandem of Joe Burrow, all of his weapons from wide receiver. I know they didn't have Jamar Chase, but even still, like, I don't know if Jamar Chase was playing like Joe Burrow. I don't know if he could have gotten in the ball based on like how little time he had to throw and make decisions. Yeah. I mean, Jamar Chase, I I think is the straw that really stirs that drink, which is nothing against Joe Burrow. I think Joe Joe Burrow's phenomenal, but I think that's more of an indictment of the offensive coaching staff. Their playbook is really basic. Um, and you can get away with that when you have players as special as they do. When you have Jamar Chase and Higgins and then Tyler Boyd, your third guy, that's an embarrassment of riches. Yes. And then you take away Jamar Chase, who's a guy you can turn and throw the ball to. And this was like a big play for them last year of just literally turning and throwing the ball to him. Yeah, yeah. And Jamar and Chase running for 60 yards because he's that good. You know, that's. But they have no run that. game. They have no run game. So like. Yeah. You know, like they, they, they don't seem to have like a very balanced offense. And, and when, when I think about the Browns, like we were just more balanced overall, like on both sides, we were pretty balanced, like defense played well, offense played well, I think special, whatever. I don't even want to talk about special teams, (laughs) but we were, we were just very balanced overall. And then two, like balancing the run game versus the pass game, which then made it very hard for Cincinnati's defense to really keep up. Not to mention, and like, I know this may be unpopular, maybe not today or this week, but it's, it was probably unpopular a week or a couple of weeks ago. I think we had the benefit and the advantage from a coaching staff standpoint, like Kevin Stefanski is a better coach than Zach Taylor. So when you add all of those things up, like we should have dominated that game and that's exactly what happened. And we do, in my opinion, we, we do and should give credit to Joe Woods because as much as we wanted to kill him for the last three or four oh, there's weeks, some numbers like, to back it up. Yeah. I, I mean, like if you're gonna, if you want to blame him for the poor play of the defense, then you have to give him credit where credit is due when the defensive unit plays well. Right. Like, mm-hmm. isn't that what we have to do? Well, the thing is Joe Woods has been really, really effective game planning against the division. In fact, the team yes. he's had the hardest time with is actually the Steelers. He's been great against both the Ravens Ravens. and the Bengals in the past nine games, which includes the three games they played this year and the six divisional games last year, they, they are averaging 18.2 yard, 18.2 points per game on defense. And 
that's not taking away things like last week where a punt return yeah. sets them up for easy points or there's a fumble on you know their side that side of the field that sets them up for points 18.2 within the division where you need to win those games it's a shame that the Browns record isn't better against the division yes. like in those nine games they're five and four but they've beat they were able to cause like last year, they got four interceptions in a game against Lamar Jackson. They lost because the offense was garbage in that game. They held, you know, held them to under twenty. I think both games last year they held them to twenty three. Yeah, this year games that part. you should you should win if your defense right. is winning. So like, yes, that's the point. Is like Joe Woods, whatever you think of him, and obviously a lot of people don't like him. He's been great within the division, and it has to start there. You have to be able to compete against that group. And yes, Andrew Barry has built a defense that is really good against the division. Having speed to be able to deal with Lamar Jackson. He had 94, the, the, the Ravens had 94 net passing yards in yeah. that game. Like it's impressive. And you sit there and go, well, they had 160 yards rushing. Yeah. It took them 44 carries to get there. Um, so yeah, there's a lot to like about, what they're doing, you know, against the Ravens, it was a relentless blitz attack to try to make Lamar Jackson uncomfortable. And despite, you know, sending so much pressure, uh, Mark, uh, their tight end, Mark yeah. Andrews had zero catches. Yes, right. And then this week, so the Browns ran too high consistently throughout the game. Joe Burrow's numbers against too high are dramatically lower than they are against single high. Not terribly surprising with the amount of weapons they have, uh, but it forces him to now check down underneath a lot and try to pick up yardage that way, which is what they were doing. But then the Browns were ultimately able to sort of get them off the field at some point in the drive, which is exactly what you want. The Bengals offensive line is still atrocious. They're, they're left. <laughs> yeah, they, tackle, upgraded. they upgraded from last year, but still really bad. Yeah. Jonah Williams. You know, I said this when he came out in the draft, I thought he was a guard. Uh, I thought he should have been a guard. I say like miles Garrett with that spin move was, embarrassing but when isaiah thomas casually swatted him aside it was dog food factory time for jonah williams like it's time to go when that's the case and like the way i've sort of described their line is they've got four guards maybe five guards the way uh, lyle collins is playing they don't have any tackles they just don't and like it's it's really problematic so the browns were able to do some stuff where they would send some pressure but they also simulated some pressure And Joe Burrow is consistently uncomfortable and he's a very good quarterback and a good decision maker. So he was able to get some of those passes out and find guys. But to your point, he was never comfortable in the game. Miles Garrett is a terrifying presence to play against. He's got uh, trying to think he had, I think he's up to six sacks in the past or in the four, four games he's played against Joe Burrow or something like that. It's, it's like ridiculous how good he is uh, in that matchup. But like, Joe Burrow now has to go into every game sitting there going, Oh God, I have to deal with this again. Like it starts to like have its twice own a impact. year, twice a year. Right? Yeah. I mean, it just has its own element of what am I going to do about this guy? And like Jadevi and Clowney played in that game, but didn't really yeah, you didn't do hear anything. Much about him. Like, and yeah. I get it. He's still recovering from the high ankle, the ankle and the, the knee, but like it was miles Garrett. There was some Isaiah Thomas that, you know, Taven Bryan chipped in half a sack, but like the defensive line, wasn't terribly good. It's just the Bengals offensive line was yes. bad and it just snowballed on him. I mean, you mentioned Joe Mixon. He had a players only meeting with the offensive line this week to talk about run block. <laughs> he did. And I then did he got like that. eight carries. I we, I did catch one clip. I was, I, I was sharing with you, Pete, like I, I'm pretty disconnected. I've been pretty disconnected today from consuming any type of social media or media in general. Um, which made me actually a couple of times, like during my work day, like think like, did I really, like, did the Browns really win last night? Like did I dream this all up because it, it didn't even feel like it felt like it just didn't even happen because I hadn't had a moment to even like listen to anything or read about anything with this team. But I did catch a clip of Joe Thomas talking about how, when he spoke with Miles Garrett after the game that Miles had said that. Joe Burrow didn't change his hard count. So like Miles was able to time things like perfectly to like pretty much wreck the game. And he was shocked by that. Yeah. I mean, look, one, you do get into some habits that can be difficult to break, but two, 
you know, I I have been always been I've been super highly critical of Zach Taylor as a head coach, yes. and then he goes to the Super Bowl last year, and I started I to beat it. But like I've never been impressed. I think their defensive coordinator is really good, but offensively, I just like I said, they run a pretty basic offense, and they get out coached a lot. But they've been able to get get over it because. But he looked mad. Wait, Pete. But he looked very mad on the sideline. Like he looked visibly frustrated and upset on the side. They showed him multiple times on the TV. And I was like laughing. Cause you know, like our criticism yes. on Kevin Stefanski is like, he's too like even keeled and like calm and cool and collected, like regardless of win or loss. So I just thought that was really funny because like they showed him visibly upset, but like, I feel like he looked like stupid. Miser- <laughs> he looked miserable. Line. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> I don't, uh, you know, I, it's one of those, you know, it, it sucks to be a coach when you have no answers. You're just like, it's yeah, just, it is what like it is what it is. He was just yeah. kind of like shaking his head too. Did like, you happen to watch the were you watching just the game broadcast or did you watch the Manning cast? So that's a great question. And I'd like to get your thoughts on this too. So I like the the Manning cast when it's not my team that I'm rooting for playing. So, I hear this like, a lot. Yeah, because like and and I'm it is what it is, but like I feel like they, they get very off base with with especially when they have people on that they're the interviewing are like not helpful yeah yeah they don't talk about the game and like that's what i really want to tune in to them sure. for if i'm like if i'm a fan of a team like i want them to actually break down like what's happening on the screen or like post play so when they have guests on i find it very hard because like they're just interviewing them as a football game's happening which i just don't really like that so i was watching just the regular broadcast And I had my kids stayed up and watched the entire first quarter with me um, or most of the entire first quarter. They were, they were pumped, um, less pumped about the zero, zero score, (laughs) nothing happening. Um, But then I had to put them to bed. And so I just stuck with that broadcast for the rest of the night. But Pete, I will tell you, we know that the Browns have kind of ruined us in a sense of like not being comfortable. I know that you, you said like you were probably pretty comfortable in that game, but I was still very uncomfortable going into the fourth quarter, like to the point where I was like, I I think Cincinnati ended up scoring pretty quickly at the beginning of the fourth quarter. Right. They did, Yes. Even though they literally only had three plays in the third quarter, they went three and out. That was the only time they possessed the ball, but I still go into full on panic mode when they score immediately in the fourth quarter. Like there's way too much time left the Browns are going to somehow find a way to blow it. Joe Burrow is going to come back from a deficit of, you know, 20 some points that he's never done before in his entire career, which means that it'll most likely happen because he's playing the Cleveland Browns. And then I started to like get in this really bad headspace. and I'm a pretty positive person, but it started just to kind of chip away at me like second by second where I'm like, Oh no, this is going to play out on a national setting. Hopefully most people at this point have already went to bed because, you know, to a casual fan, this, this game's pretty boring, like not much is happening, but I was just thinking about how, if the Browns somehow found a way to blow it, Joe Burrow becomes this big hero from this major comeback win. And then the next day and the next day and the next day, it's all these storylines about how the Browns are a disaster and who they need to fire and what are they going to do? They already sold the farm and it was going to be a week and a half of this going into like out of the bye week. And I just like, I was just in a really bad spot until there was about like six minutes left. And then I was calm. My husband fell asleep. I was mad at him for falling asleep because how can you fall asleep? We haven't gotten many victories this year. So like, let's just stay up and enjoy this. I'm going to watch it until the final, final play. I'm going to listen to Jacoby Brissett's interview. I'm going to go on Twitter and be happy. So that's what I did, Pete. Six minutes to go. I felt better. I wouldn't say I was comfortable heading to the fourth <laughs> quarter I, because my thought process was pretty much this. If you're Kevin Stefanski, your whole thing, if you're that, if you're that coaching staff, you're literally saying to all those guys, we have to, we have to play a complete four quarter game. Like, yes, we have to, which they one, haven't really done, which they haven't done, yeah. which, which is why you're able to say, we need to play a full four quarter game. You're sitting there going, if we do that and we take that into the bye week that's a major boost. And I think it is that you were able to say, no, yes. we beat these guys from start to finish yes. in a division game against a team that was in the Super Bowl last year, a team with a better record, all of these things. They had all, you know, all the reason to believe that they, they were going to come in and beat them. I, I, I just thought that was what they were stressing. And then it carried over like the guys in the field kept playing. And that was what I, what I wanted to see. So that ultimately made me feel, you know, reasonably confident they were going to take, take care of business. I watched the Manning cast 
and I and I grant I I don't enjoy the interview part, but yeah, I I knew what was going to happen, which was they were going to experience what I experienced every week. I watched Jacoby Brissett, which is there are situations where it's oh no, Jacoby, you can't do that, which is they literally <laughs> said during the game, like when he when he sort of had that awkward fumble, yes, and, and like some of those things. When he threw the ball, he was great. Like he was throwing terrific passes. The ball downfield to Amari Cooper was in a spot where only Amari Cooper can make a play. And it was spectacular. He just plucked the ball inches from the ground. Uh, for oh, that was yards. amazing. Like there, any that was, was a third. That was a third down play call too. And uh, yes, Pete, Pete, which you I know thought what I was thinking. Time. I was thinking. I was like, had Amari Cooper not caught that ball, how many people would have wanted Kevin Stefanski's head for calling that play on a third down? It was like, what was it, third and two? No, it was like th- that. In this case, I think it was third and nine. Okay, they so ran, okay, they fine. ran to a wall twice. Oh, and then okay. they, they went yeah. for it. I think that might have been when I started to panic, and then when that when they pulled that playoff, I was like, I think I can calm down now. But that's why I like that style of play calling because you're sitting there thinking the Bengals. You know, everybody's sitting there. Oh, they're just going to try to milk the clock. Yep, yep. yep, And instead, he, you know, and maybe that's what happened earlier in the year. They got too comfortable doing that. Instead, he went for the throat, uh, going down down downfield in that situation, and and they capitalized. Like it paid off. Like that's why you do those things. But yeah, I mean, like Jacoby Brissett when he threw the ball, the the other time when he almost went double coverage uh, to Mari Cooper, and then all of a sudden he sees. Donovan Peoples Jones going with that that uh, deep cross wide open. He suddenly goes, oh, pulls it down, finds Donovan Peoples Jones open. They capitalize on that. You get Donovan Peoples Jones with the hurdle and all kinds of stuff that was just like it's very weird when I watch see sort of people evaluate Jacoby Brissett. Like Jacoby Brissett had a good game. He also does dumb shit. Like these yes, are, but also like at the most inopportune times. Yes, yes, he has <laughs> it's, a, like, it's like his timing is awful. Like, Yes, like not dumb shit. Like they come at like the worst moments possible. Yes. And the fumble was awful. And there's some other plays you're sitting there going, you know, when, when he, when they're sending cover zero and you know, they're blitzing and he just holds the ball. Like it has to come out. Like those are the things you're sitting there going, Jacoby, I know you're very smart but you have to be able to do this. I thought he was actually going to run out of, like, I thought he was going to get sacked going into halftime too. And the play, the the clock was going to run out and we weren't even going to be able to kick a field goal. Yeah. And it like, you know, that brings up other haunting visions. Like if, you know, if you watch Ohio state and like, and, and how they, they ended up in the half without getting anything, trying to do the exact same thing. But yeah, I mean, Jacoby Brissett good when he throws the ball great when he, you know, it can be very good when he has, the protection, which, as as you mentioned earlier, was outstanding for the most part. Yes, they got some pressure, but it was because they sent a thousand guys, uh, you know, to try to, to to try to create it. I was, you know, if I if I had a complaint about play calling, it was the fact that they didn't really have an adjustment for that. I thought they were. This was a team begging to be screened, whether it was to a running back or just a wide receiver, to try to capitalize on that. But you know, Jacoby Reset makes the, the 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 scramble for the end zone and he thought that was like a redemptive moment for him and I guess in some ways it was he drops back doesn't force a pass rolls to his left and, and then charges forward and wins the race to the pylon talking about how much it weighed on him that he threw the pick against the chargers and some of those things so you know th- those are important moments from then it's one of those again another situation where you sort of like you really enjoy the journey of Jacoby Brissett because he is yes. he is a ter- terrific person uh, that that makes it fun for him, but so it was. It was good that that you know in that moment that Jacoby Brissett was able to be the quarterback. It seems like in some ways he's always going to have these lapses, but he is learning in certain respects. And now all of a sudden you're sitting there going, you know, you, you can talk yourself into maybe they steal a game or two before uh, Deshaun Watson comes back. And, and we're only three games away from that uh, at that's, this point. That's it's gone wild. quick. To see that, to see the offense churning away, to create with Nick Chubb, to see these receivers thrive, you're sitting there going, well, man, if they had David Njoku, what were they going to do with him? Uh, Yeah, it was just, that was just fun. It's not, you know, it's stressful to watch it. And that's, you know, like I said, I I knew watching the Manning cast, I was going to get some of that where they're literally going, oh, no. But uh, yeah, like it's, he's an adventure, Uh, but uh, it, it was it was fun to win like that. 
It was. It was the best game, obviously, of the season. Yeah, I mean, I even, think the, even no though question. we were on pins, even though we were a little bit on pins and needles, even like going into the fourth quarter, just because that's that's just what we do. That's just how we are, I guess, wired as Browns fans to like not be comfortable because we've seen so many unexpected things happen watching this team play. But yeah, we just it just we were we were physical. We we had passion. We had fire from the start of the game all the way to the end of the game. Like they didn't let up. They didn't give up. They they kept kind of just which I wanted them. To, I wanted to see a massacre on Halloween. And th- and that's pretty much what we got. Like even when the Bengals scored, it just it felt like they just didn't have a chance. And when they didn't recover the onside kick and it went out of bounds, I was like, oh, my gosh, thank God, because like if that had like gone a different way, I was like, oh, we are setting ourselves up for like another an- another situation of like just feeling like things were not going to go our way. But hey, I hope Pete and I know we're going to have time to talk about it because the Browns are going on a bye week, but I hope this was not an exception game. And this is something that we see going forward with this team where it's not just a, Hey, a flash in the pan. This is going to be the way that this team performs and functions moving forward. Well, yeah, I think defensively it carried over from last week. Um, You know, I think they got a good effort and, and they lost. So it's sort of like, undermines a little bit they lose it's sort of like oh whatever they lost but they, the defense did play well in that game i think that carried over into this game that same level of confidence that same level of detail oriented and they played really well now you you come out of that and now you have a bye week where you can potentially one continue to to maintain that focus and preparation but two you may get you know we've got to see what's going to happen with denzel ward jadavian clowny yep. and jok okay, but those are three three potential impact players on this defense you could get back for coming out of the bye week against the Miami Dolphins. Like if they can carry this over and they maintain that momentum and those guys come back healthy and effective and they just sort of add into what the Browns are already doing, all of a sudden you can talk yourself into how good can this side of the ball be? Can they sort of be what we thought they were going to be at the beginning of the season? Or is that who they are now? Like last year, where they sort of rode that momentum and and, and carried it forward, that would be great. They're going to have two really tough tests out of the bye week: Miami Dolphins followed by Buffalo Bills, both on the road. Two explosive offenses that have a ton of receivers. It's you know, in some ways, you're sitting there, man. Why do they have to play these two teams? But I'm sort of like excited about this because they did play so well, and if they can just maintain, they don't. They aren't going to. I don't expect that they're suddenly going to shut out the Miami Dolphins or just eviscerate the Buffalo Bills. <laughs> right. But if they just play with the same level of preparation, the same level of confidence, the same level of physicality, they play that speed, I think they can give them a real game. I think they can get give give themselves a chance to win. And if you do win one of those games, all of a sudden you're going, oh man, like where where how good can this group be? So like I agree. Like, and that's what I said after this, like you can't have, you know, all the stuff come out about professionalism and work ethic and respond one game and then turn around and it just goes back to the way it was. It has to carry over. And if it doesn't, then the bronze uh, organization at the end of the year is ultimately going to decide we're going to get rid of the children and keep the professionals. Yes, And that's, sort of where this thing is going, which is always interesting to me because like so many people are stressing this idea of accountability. That's where the accountability is going to come in. This is an audition for a lot of these guys. It's an audition for, for Taven Bryan, for Jordan Elliott, for Tommy Togia. It's an audition for uh, some of these young receivers, some of these young defensive backs. If they can't figure it out and then the Browns are ultimately going to either move on or come up with a way to make, you know, a a different team next year that's going to be more equipped and ready to go. It's the 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 frustration is that by trading for Deshaun Watson, it sort of sets you back on having some of these veterans that you had. The Browns got actually younger on defense this year because they lost guys like Malik Jackson. They lost that linebacker whose name Malcolm Smith. They lost Troy Hill. Like they lost a lot of these somewhat veteran players yep. and got younger. I, what one of the things I'm hoping is a byproduct of this like mess is that they find some of these guys to be leaders. It sounds like Sione Taki Taki is a leader in that group. You know, I, I hope that's the case. They need all the, the the help they can get. 
I'm hoping that guys like JOK and Greg Newsom, guys that the Browns like identified as part of the reason they love them as prospects is because they're really mature yep. and had some of those characteristics that like this type of situation sort of allows them to, to, to come to the forefront and take control, especially, and I hate that, you know, you, you don't want to have Denzel Ward out, but, and especially for the reason he's out, but in that, in that vacuum is, is somebody going to step, is somebody stepping up because they have to, um, those are opportunities to sort of make that, that step in the right direction. So I'm hoping that when the Browns get ready to face the Miami Dolphins, it's it's less about oh man, I you know it's tough to play the Dolphins, it's tough to play the Bills, and it's more like, you know what, maybe they lose one, maybe they lose both of these games, but I really want to see how this team can do against this because it's really what this year has become, is figuring out who they are and what they can do, and you add in the whole Deshaun Watson element of, you know, three more games of him and, until he comes back if he's able to play well all of a sudden it's going to be a reason. Obviously his personal issues are his personal issues and you're either going to dis- dislike him on that or, or sort of move on. But if he plays well, it's going to suddenly allow people to have their imagination run, run wild in terms right. of one, what can they do in those last six games? And then two, what does that look like in 2023 when the Browns are seemingly more primed to make that big run? Yes. I have one final and parting thought. And it is in regard to the defense. I think the other encouraging thing coming out of these last two games, and obviously the Browns went one and one in these in these last two games before the bye, but it's that the defense performed well against good offenses and specifically good quarterbacks because we as fans were disappointed in how they performed against, you know, some no-name quarterbacks, against some of the bottom quarterbacks in the league or, you know, third string quarterbacks. But the fact that they were able to turn it around against Lamar Jackson and Joe Burrow gives me more confidence as we head into this stretch of really good offensive teams, but also like really good quarterbacks. So I think that's encouraging. And obviously Mm -hmm. you have a bye week um, in addition to get even more prepared. But I I think for me, that's kind of what I'm looking forward to as we move forward over the next couple of of weeks. It's always weird that like, you know, people complain that, and obviously they did not perform very well against like some of the, the, some of the offenses they played against, but they did play relatively well against the chargers. Justin Herbert. Yeah. Against the was good successful, but he, he didn't like go off by any stretch. Yeah. Hey, listen, I'm going to, I said, I have my final thought, but listen, Pete, I'm going to, I'm going to associate or compare this to like when I play pickleball. So <laughs> I have to get my pickleball story in. So I'm pretty decent at pickleball. I'm, I'm good. I'm pretty competitive. I'm, I'm quick. I've got, I've got quick hands. Decent for um, champion. I understand. And you know, pickleball is, there's a ton of different skill levels that you're playing with and, or against. I find myself when I'm playing against weaker competition, I tend to like not slack off a little bit, but I tend to like play down to their level. Mm-hmm. Um, I I'm not matching the intensity that I have when I'm playing against a better a better team specifically. So like, sometimes I wonder if that does go into it where, you know, the, the, it's not like they're not taking the quarterback seriously or maybe not taking them seriously, but like, I don't know, there is something about like just matching that intensity and or effort level, or even in some cases with pickleball, sometimes the bad players are a bit unpredictable. Like the less talented players are more unpredictable. And so I can't quite read what they're going to do because it's very unconventional of how they play the game. So like, I'm not saying that that, that has anything to do with it or not. Like when it comes to like the Stevens playing against good quarterbacks versus bad quarterbacks, there's obviously less film on the ones that are a little bit more unknown or there's, there's less consistent things because they're just kind of throwing it all out there to see what sticks. So that's my final parting parting thoughts on quarterbacks and defenses, how it compares to my pickleball game. My mom will appreciate this. Well, another champion. Um, yeah, look, <laughs> the bottom line is the Browns played reasonably okay against the Chargers defensively. The offense didn't do enough to win that game. The Browns played well against Lamar Jackson. The offense didn't do enough, and neither did special teams to win that game. The defense played really well against Joe Burrow. They do win that game. I do think there was a real issue of professionalism, and I think some of that was also – being discouraged by the Deshaun Watson stuff. I think on some level, 
that the Browns who crushed it all summer, at least that's always been the talk that they were great all summer found out one, it was six games. And I think they, like most people were kind of like, okay, we can get through this. And then yeah, it became yeah. 11. I think even if they didn't consciously sort of take their foot off the gas, I think there's a part of them, which sort of like can't help, but sort of think, think to themselves. Yeah. I don't know if this season's it. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. And, and I do, you know, my, my complete speculation is I do think the car wreck messed up the vibe of that locker room. Yeah. I think Miles Garrett as one would was sort of like, he went through a harrowing experience and, you know, in, in some ways, you know, the car, the, the, the car did what it was supposed to do, but like on some level, he has to be sitting there. Even if he's sitting there saying to himself, I know I was going to be all right. I think it's more about in terms of the guilt of the passenger in that situation where you're sitting there going, Holy crap. Like they could have gotten seriously injured or worse. And I think that's sort of took him out of being as involved as a leader. And obviously he was in some level of feeling guilty that he sort of put his team in the situation that, that this thing that was entirely avoidable, even if it, you know, even if you chalk it up to shit happens, he holds himself to such a high standard. I think that took him out of it a little bit. I think him playing better is does help coincide with the fact one he's really really freaking good makes the defense better but I also think it sort of revved him up in terms of his level of engagement in that room. So it's not a defense to say it, it's certainly not to say that it's acceptable that all these things happen but they did happen and I do think they have a small effect. I do think that the professionalism was a legitimate check that they had to sort of figure out and I'm hoping that's we never have to deal with that again because it's just stupid um, that we're there, but that now they can sort of, to your point, stop playing to the level of competition and sort of strive for excellence and sort of become a team that co- consistently plays at a high level, in, you know, every game. That's where I like the challenge of what the dolphins and the bills can p- potentially offer is it's going to see if they can match that. Even if they lose those games, if the defense plays well, it's something to build upon. The last thing to touch on for this is the fact that the Browns didn't make any moves at the deadline. I'm not terribly surprised. I was kind of hoping that they would trade Kareem Hunt and Greta Williams, but it's hardly the end of the world. They're still here. A million trades happened. In some ways, my initial thought is, and and, and complete could be completely wrong, is that I kind of like that teams like the 49ers went super heavy into trading for guys like Christian McCaffrey. Obviously that didn't come at the deadline, but like they gave up a whole lot of picks for him. And now Carolina's got a whole lot of picks, but they're not really a threat. The Miami Dolphins traded a first round pick to get Bradley Chubb. Obviously that's going to make them better. The Broncos get a first round pick back, but at least it's forcing the Dolphins who are an AFC potential contender. It's forcing to, at least it's expensive expend assets to do it uh teams like the eagles are unfortunately didn't give up a whole lot because their gm howie roseman's really really good at his job but on some level it does feel like a little bit like the browns because they don't view 2022 as their year that all these other teams are sort of getting into the mix and trying to make moves and stuff which is great but that some of those teams are inevitably going to fail and may not be in that same position for 2023 and certainly there will be teams that will be in a position to make big moves like the chargers. I continue to suspect they will trade draft picks for Sean Payton, but (laughs) like those are all things where the Browns get to sort of wait till everybody else is done. And then next year, hopefully, at least that's the thought or, you know, with with this run 23, 23 to 26, that it's going to allow the Browns to have some very good opportunities to make a big run or multiple big runs that allows them to get to the Super Bowl. So I'm a little bummed, uh, you know, uh, Kareem Hunt sort of, he's acted slightly childish in this whole thing. Even the interview with the mask on was just very strange, uh, but he did ask for a trade. And then he was sort of like, when asked, he was sort of like, whatever happens, happens type thing, which is, I guess, fine. But um, it's just been a weird dynamic. I, I don't expect him back next year, although I, I can't rule it out. I don't think he's going to have the much in terms of, offers the Browns may be able to bring him back for practically nothing. You know, they are where they are in terms of their personnel. They're keeping the guys they have. They're going to continue working this thing. That's fine. Uh, I mean, you know, that's my initial reaction. Maybe I'll have 
more thoughts in a week, but where are you at on all? Listen, I had no idea what was happening today because I was I was stuck in an office building all day. And so I got out and I didn't get any alerts on my phone and I wasn't on Twitter really at all. So I assumed that the Browns did nothing. I don't know, Pete, we've talked about this. It it feels like this wasn't supposed to be the year that the Browns really sure. made any type of noise. So I'm not surprised in some sense. I think from a fan base perspective, yeah, I can see people being mad about it. Um, I think people expect a lot more for Kareem than probably what he's worth at this point. Um, happy to have him on the team. I, I think we obviously are able to utilize him in a way that works for the Browns. Um, but at the end of the day, like I can understand not wanting to give him up for practically peanuts. So um, sure. it is, it is what it is at this point. Yeah. I mean, look that, that at this point, if they do sign elsewhere, Greedy Wayne is almost certainly is going to sign elsewhere. If Kareem Hunt signs elsewhere, um, Jack Conklin likely signs elsewhere. Um, they will now be part of the compensatory pick formula. It's hard to know what that's going to look like because of the Brown sign guys next year. It's obviously going to counter some of that, but it's something to keep an eye on. You know, they, they, they can continue to pile up assets for the future. I presume that Jack Conklin is going to return a third round pick uh, in 2024. If at worst a fourth, but for the moment they continue to have those guys continue to try to get better. I'm curious, you know, one of the things I thought about in terms of Kareem Hunt, a lot depends on where Jerome Ford is and his recovery is still in IR. Yep. I, I felt like it would have been more likely the Browns made a move if they felt like Jerome Ford was like ready to go and they're ready to activate him. We won't find out until probably the end of two weeks from now when, you know, they t- tend to activate guys right before they're going to play. But if he's practicing, that'd be a factor. But anyway, the Browns get a big win. They're three and five. You know, they have an opportunity. I sort of looked at this team and I thought four and seven was a very reasonable record for them to have when Deshaun Watson returned. I think that is achievable right now. I think four and seven is very realistic. If they can snag an extra one, that would be pretty good. It's a good feeling to have, even though it's the only win of win of October. It's certainly a big one. And then, you know, heading into the bye week, I think the Browns are in a pretty good spot. Can they rally from here? Hopefully. Uh, but we will be back next week to talk about that during the bye week. Big thank you to all the people finding us on YouTube. That's been great. Uh, if you can subscribe, like all those things, that's certainly helpful as well. Uh, but it's been awesome to see the amount of people sort of finding us, which has been Uh, a pleasant surprise. Uh, Other than that, we will be back um, with the good news being that the Browns cannot lose over the next week. So there's that three and five. Here we go.